This is a letter to the church written in Ephesus. In fact, as Paul opens up this letter and as he is addressing the recipients, he calls them saints. Saints. It's addressed to the saints who are in Ephesus. That word saint simply means holy ones. Uh, Literally, that's what it means. Uh, Distinct ones. Those who are unlike everybody else in Ephesus and like unlike everybody else who have not trusted in Christ as their Lord and Savior. And so it's addressed to the saints, the holy ones, those who have been called out of this world and separated and set apart to Jesus Christ and for his kingdom and for his purpose. Uh, the emphasis of this letter is for these holy ones to know who they are and how they should live. So he tells them that they're holy ones, and he tells them all about what that means and why they are holy. And uh, he says, now because of that, you should live this way. And so our text this morning in Ephesians 2, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 10, it would fall underneath the section of who you are, who you are. Now, the understanding of who you are should lead to obedience to Jesus Christ. Because of your understanding of who you are, that should motivate your obedience and how you live, right? But today, we live in a, we, we, in a, in a world and in Christianity today where there's a disconnect. You have people who claim to know Jesus Christ. You have people to claim that they know who they are and yet their speech is laced with profanity. You have people that claim to know Jesus Christ. They say, this is who I am, and yet how they live looks nothing like who they are. And how they live and how they act betrays their profession of faith, whether it be in their job, whether it be in the workplace, whether it be out in front of a neighbor, whether it be in front of social media, on a platform, And what you post, what you like, what you share, all of that somehow seems to be disconnected from who you are. And so Paul, as he's writing this letter to Ephesians, he's wanting to take those two ideas, who you are, how you should live, and bring them together. And I tell you, that's exactly what we need to see today in our Christianity. Would you agree? Would you agree for us holy ones in here today, we need to revisit this and understand who we are, yet marry that to exactly how we should live and obey Jesus Christ as Lord of our lives today. So we're going to revisit this this morning in a message I've entitled, Our Testimony. Our Testimony. If you're in Ephesians 2 verse 1, would you say amen? Amen. Let's read verses 1 through 3. You'll notice our testimony. It begins with our past Right, We weren't born into sainthood. You weren't born holy, unlike what some would say. Verse 1 says, And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as the others. Now that should be a wake-up call for us holy ones. You weren't born holy. You had a past. We all have a past. And uh, it's this first text here, portion of it, uh, speaks to our previous condition. And so I'm just going to walk down through these verses and pull these things out. And so verse 1, notice our previous condition. Now, if they were wondering at this point, is Paul talking about us yet? That's settled in the first two words, and you. That is towards you. And you, I'm speaking to you. And so for all of us holy ones in the room, our ears should perk perk up as where, and you. And if you have a translation like mine, it might say, and he made alive. Yours might just go right on to who were dead. That's actually probably more accurate. If you have a translation like mine and it says, he made alive, it's in italics, which means that's been added by translators. And so, but no, no additions needed. They try to do that for clarity, but the emphasis needs to be on who were dead. 
and you who were dead in trespasses and sins. So what dead? You were spiritually dead. This is your past. Uh, physically alive, but you did not have God's spirit within you. You had no relationship with God. You were moving. You were acting from a, a human appearance. You were living, but you were absolutely dead. Now, if you're dead, that means you got no hope, right? If you're dead, you're dead. There, you're helpless. There's nothing you can do on your own to get out of that situation. There is nothing to, you can because you're dead. You're spiritually dead. This is a spiritual condition. And if you just think back towards your past, you know what this text is speaking of. You were helpless, you were hopeless, you felt all alone, there was nothing you could do, and you were just held captive. And notice it's a situation that you and I created. It's just, we, we got in this situation that was all fault. He's all fault. He said, You were dead in trespasses and sins. Trespasses. And sins, and so trespass, that's to take a step you didn't take, that you shouldn't take. That's a step that, that, that is a trespass, and we call that sin. Trespasses and sin is the result of our spiritual deadness. Sin is the offense. Uh, it's the violation of God's perfect standard. It's what left us helpless. We were dead because of our transgressions, our trespasses, and our sins. Nobody's fault but our own. And that's something we inherited from our daddy, Adam. Adam passed this down when he and Eve broke that trespass in the Garden of Eden. And all throughout history of the world, this spiritual deadness has been passed on, meaning we must then be born again. We must be born anew. We had to have something to be done because of this previous condition. And by the way, spiritual deadness is a past we all share. If this would be your present, uh, this would mean you still need to be born again. But for the holy ones in the room, it's a past we all share. You were born into this condition, and there's nothing you can do about it. There's nothing you can do to get out of it on your own. Notice now he moves to the previous conduct. He says, you are dead in trespasses and sins. And look at verse 2. In which you once walked according to the course of this world. When he says walked, he means that's, you live this way. Uh, the course of this world. That means the, the, the word there is age. It's going to show up again in the age of this world. It's the world system. You lived based on a world system, and according to this world system, uh, who was absolutely contrary to the standard of God. Uh, so the world is broken. We live in a broken, fallen world. Uh, a world has determined standards that are right and wrong, that is viewed very differently than what God views and determines right and wrong. And so in our past, we didn't live up to God's standard. We lived and acted towards what was appropriate to a lost world. And we would get approval from a lost world. We uh, embraced the system of a lost world. And here's the thing. The world is only following the pattern of its leader. Notice in verse 2 it says, according to the course of this world, which is according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. This is a reference to Satan. And so Satan, the, the real leader of this world, who is operating, it says he works in the sons of disobedience. Disobedience in the Bible always, always, always is disobedience to God. And our real enemy, where he set up his throne, where he set up his seat of authority, where he has set up his operation, is in humanity's fallen sinful condition. And through humanity's sinful condition and our spiritual deadness, he exercises his will. And if we look at a world and we think, man, that is absolutely not what God says. That is absolutely wrong. That is sin, what God calls sin. 
and what is good that God calls good, the world calls sin, what you have ultimately behind the scenes is Satan at work in this. Our real enemy, God's real enemy, who does not care about God's perfect standard and who would love to see this world continue to trespass and sin against almighty God. And so uh, the, the image I get in my mind is like a puppet. You know, a, a puppet, you can, put, you can put it on your hand and you can do it, but ultimately, who's really doing it? Well, the, the, the puppet master, the one who is actually working that out. And so you might say, well, are we at fault then if Satan is the one that's ultimately doing this, if it's his seat of authority and how he works in our spiritual deadness? Uh, he's lost that battle, by the way, if you're in Christ, but uh, he's still at work in this world today. But notice our previous cravings. It says in verse 3, among whom we also all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. And so we can't blame it all on Satan. He's just using our heart's sinful cravings uh, that is absolutely contrary uh, to God's perfect standard. Here's the thing. Our behavior is not just in line with the world. Our previous behavior was in line with Satan himself. And he uses our previous cravings. Uh, notice Paul's not picking on them. If you look in verse 3, what does he say? Among whom also we. Do you see that word we? Paul put himself in that category. Paul says, I have this same previous condition as you. This is a universal truth for all of humanity. We've all done this. We've all lived by the seat of our pants. We've all lived by what we thought was good. And we all live by those cravings. Uh, we live by the lusts of our flesh. And all the lusts of our flesh and of our heart and of our mind, it just simply drove our actions. You know, uh, I think back of a time when I was about 10 years old and I got to have an opportunity to drive a car. And my parents didn't know about it. Uh, we were on family vacation, by the way. And so I had this crazy uncle or cousin or something. I don't know what he was. We called him all kinds of stuff. But he was just crazy. You got someone like that in your family out there? I certainly do. And so his name was Bobby. He was cool, but he was crazy. And man, he just told me straight up, he's, you know, I was going to, me and my brother were going to ride with him to go to this pizza place. My parents were going to go. We said, can we ride with Bobby? They said, okay. And then, so they, they went, we're supposed to follow him. But right before we get in the car, Bobby goes, you want to drive? And I was like, yeah, thinking he's not going to let me. I mean, I barely see over the wheel. And he goes, all right, there's the keys. And sure enough, I thought, well, he's going to stop me at some point. And he never did. I started the car. He said, pull that stick down. And then uh, there's the go, there's the stop, and uh, just go. And I was like, okay. And he was like, and I was like, I don't know how I'm doing. And I began driving this car, and he's just like, you're doing fine. Well, on the way there, my parents get there first, and they see this car that comes from the, from the, the lane where the cars are supposed to be over curbs and just right on into the pizza place, coming in hot, barely, we... we we, it was a, almost a huge disaster. And to my parents' dismay, here I, I get out of the car. They were like, there's no way he drove here. Bobby, what are you doing? Cool, but man, he was crazy. But if anybody else was just looking at that car, who in the world is doing that? Why, why is that car going that way? Well, all you got to do is just look behind the wheel, and that'll tell you who's really driving it. If you're going to look at our fallen condition that we live amongst in our world, if we're going to look at all and think, what in the world is going on? Just look behind the wheel, and that'll tell you what's really going on. On the outside, it looks one way. I'm telling you, behind the wheel, you got humanity's sinful, fallen condition at play. You have people doing whatever's right in their own eyes, people living by their lust of the, their flesh, their cravings, all this selfish, whatever is going to be best for me people living by that, no wonder you see what you see. Just look behind the wheel. And what you have behind the wheel is spiritual deadness 
And then you've got Satan, the spirit, the power of the air, who is working amidst that. And then now you can look around the world and you see what's really going on. By the way, as you look, we remember that was our past too. We can never forget where we came from. We say, oh, we're holy. We're holy ones now. But that's, that's our past. And for some who claim to know Jesus Christ, it seems to be their present. I, I, I've, I've been saved. I've, I know that the blood of Jesus has covered me. And I know Jesus. And yet you look at their life and it still looks like the past. For someone that comes out of verses 1 through 3, you would think this stuff would be a part of the past, not a part of the present or the future. But we live in a, in a world today where you'll find Christians and there's a disconnect that should not be. If we've been saved and that's our past, that stuff needs to stay in our past. Could I get an amen? Our previous cravings, down to our various, very core, it says, were by nature children of wrath. Down to our nature, children of wrath, just as what? The others, just like everybody else. What do we deserve because of this? God's wrath. Everyone in verses 1 through 3, which is all of humanity, is deserving of God's wrath. That's what we deserve. But here's what we get, and it comes in verse 4. But God. Aren't those words beautiful? Aren't you, aren't you glad those are there? Right after children of wrath, we deserve God's wrath. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. But God, what a wonderful truth that we were in verses 1 through 3. We were fallen, we were dead, but God who is rich in mercy. See, we were born into our present. That's our testimony. We have a past, right? But you, how do you go from your past into your present? Through a new birth. And you're born, you're, you're born again, spiritual birth that must take place and if you haven't been born again you are still deserving of God's wrath and that is still that wrath is still abiding on you even now you must be born again born anew and it's because of the nature of God it says God's nature right is completely different in ours God is rich in mercy and it says because of his great love with which he loved us so God withholds what people deserve Mercy is compassion to help those who need it. Uh, I'm coaching my son's basketball team, and uh, this past week we had practice, and I said, all right, for every free throw you miss, you're going to have to run. And so I start making them run. Well, I quickly realized, man, there's a couple of these kids that they really needed to stop running. Some were handling it okay, but there was a few I was looking at, and I thought, my goodness, I'm going to send them home blue in the face. And so uh, I'm, I'm kind of praying with them, right? Please make this next free throw so I ain't got to make them run. I already set the rules up. And so anyway, the kid comes up, misses, misses two in a row. And I just see one of these kids, he's look, I see the look on his face. And I just came over and I said, you know what? We'll just run one instead of two. And it was just like a, and man, uh, I saw it in his face. And then they ran and I sent him home alive. Now he deserved two, but... I looked on him and with compassion. It says God is rich in that. Aren't you glad that he looks at us with pity and compassion and withholds what we deserve because of our need for him to show us mercy? And I'm telling you, he's got enough mercy he doesn't run out. He's rich. He's got plenty of it. I believe with all my heart he's got enough that if every single person would fall on their face and be broken over their sin and call out to God for mercy, he still wouldn't run out. He's rich in mercy. He won't turn a heart away who's broken and who needs God's mercy and who will cry out for it. Rich in mercy. And then it says, because of his great love with which he loved us. I'm glad for that word great in there. His great love. His great love with which he loved us. 
God's love isn't selfish. It looks after you and it looks after me. It's even offered to the children of wrath. That's how great his love is. If you think about the nature of God, you also think about the newness of life. Here's the thing. You actually think that you're alive until you're born again. You try to talk to a spiritually dead person and you say, you know what? You're dead. They're going to look at you like you're crazy. You can give them all the scriptures you want. You can have this person come up through all the Sunday school departments, through youth, through all of this, and a person be spiritually dead. And here's the thing. Once you are born again, you know it. Once you're born again, you can look back and say, man, that was my past, and I have a new birth. And you realize now that you're alive. But if you were today to, you know, if that's fuzzy for you and you were to look back, here's the thing. And I'll just tell you the truth today. That's what you came to hear, right? You're still in your spiritual deadness. It's a new birth that happens in a moment when you call out to Jesus Christ, when you really surrender all of your heart towards him. If your past in Christ is fuzzy with the present, it, it's not because you, your, your testimony isn't as radical as the next person. It's not because uh, of any of those things. Because whether you're good on the outside or evil on the outside, everyone is evil on the inside. Everyone is in need of a new birth. Every single person, I don't care how put together they look, has a sinful craving that only seeks after itself, has a sin nature they got from their daddy, Adam, and is in need of a new birth. And if your past is fuzzy with your present, or if you can't figure out why your past and your, and your present don't match, there might be an answer for you. But you need to be born again. And you are born into this new life. And uh, it's what happens at your conversion. You're forgiven of all of your sin, past, present, and future. By grace, by grace, you are saved from punishment of your sin. And when you experience that lavished on you, you can't ever forget it. You can't ever forget it. Uh, notice some truths that happen. I mean, notice what he says. We were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. He's going to pick that up again. And then he says, and raised us up together. He's talking about the resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus Christ becomes real for you. Here's the thing. When you get born again, Easter Sunday becomes every day of your life. You realize the resurrection power is in you. And when you sing these songs that are talk about it, it's personal. Resurrection Sunday is, is real to you. Christmas, the fact that you, you consider that God sent forth his son to be born, to step into humanity in the incarnation, that's real to you. It's personal at that point. All of his power there in the resurrection, just that's what caused your new birth and you were stamped and sealed with your guarantee that's the Holy Spirit. And uh, there's no way that all of that can happen and you not realize it. You're made to sit together with Christ. You're given a new home. See, before you were made to sit together with Christ, this belonging, you didn't have that. Your past wouldn't let you have that. Your condition, your previous condition wouldn't let, let that happen. But now because you've been made right with God, you're made to sit with Jesus. You are giving a sonship, a daughtership because of his blood. Isn't it amazing to think that you can go from verses 1 through 3 and God come in and rescue you out. And even in spite of all you've done here, he would put you in the heavenly places with Christ. Giving you a place to sit with him. Resurrecting you. Just like he did Jesus. And then he says, it made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Once you get a taste of the new life, I'll tell you this, you don't want the old anymore. You get a taste of any of that, the old stuff won't do it. It won't, it won't do it. Um, that old language just really doesn't sit well with you. The old movies you used to watch, maybe even the music you would listen to and that your heart used to love singing about, it just, can't, just doesn't do it for you anymore. Your old way of life changes because of the new birth. And that's, that's normal. That's necessary. That should happen. There should not be a disconnect for you to run back into verses 1 through 3 and follow all of that. 
Would you agree? You still tracking with me? We sh once you get a taste of the new birth and the new life, you need more of it. And the spirit within you crying out, Abba, Father, that's what he's reaching for. Wants more of that, wants more of that, and less of what you used to participate. The new life in Christ, there's nothing better. Old won't do it. What, what now? Is it over? We're saved? We're born again? Look with me in verse 7. It says that in the ages to come, there's that word age again. You saw it with age of the world. Now it's in this new age to come, after your conversion, that in the age to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Well, that he might show who? A lost world. That he might show everyone how awesome he is. God gets to show off through your life. And here's the deal. Point number three, you're built for a purpose. And your purpose is to display God's grace. Your purpose is to go out into a lost world that's filled with rebellion and sinful condition. It's filled with all this old atmosphere we used to thrive in. We go back into that and we display God's grace. Exceeding riches of his grace, it says, uh, towards us in Christ Jesus. I like that word exceeding, exceeding riches of his grace. There is nothing that can surpass it. Exceeding riches of his grace. Your old sin cannot surpass the exceeding richness of his grace. There's nothing that you could have ever done that would surpass his grace. Aren't you thankful that you can cry out, I'm forgiven. I have been made righteous with him and the exceeding richness of his grace grace and his kindness. Where do we find it? In Christ Jesus. Here's the thing. God wants to show off through your life. God wants to show off you're his trophy, that he sends back into a lost world. And when people look at you, they think, how in the world did that change happen? How is that person now walking like that? And the person can't take credit for it. They have to give glory to Almighty God. Our testimony should be a walking advertisement of how awesome God is, how good he is, and his kindness towards us in Christ. He even goes to say, look, we can't even take credit for this. Verse 8 says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Did you catch that? You can't even boast about it. There's nothing you can do to take credit for it because you didn't do anything to, to achieve it. Someone in verses 1 through 3 can't crawl out of that situation. You can't do enough good works to get out of your spiritual deadness. There is nothing you can do other than receive the exceeding richness of God's grace and his kindness, which he only gives out in his son, Christ Jesus. You'll find it no other place. But when you find it there and you step forth as God's trophy, you realize it, you didn't do nothing. It was all him. You didn't work for it. It's only by faith. Let me pull this phrase out here. For by grace you have been saved. You understand what grace is? Unmerited favor. It's a gift. It's charis. It's, you, it's just a gift. How do you receive it? Through faith. And usually you'll have groups out there, theological groups, they'll focus one, on one or the other. Paul uses both. It's by God's grace. There's nothing you can do to earn it. It's just favor. But you can accept it through exercising faith. You, you hear the word of God. This is the gospel you're hearing. This is the good news for all of humanity. And when you hear it, the Holy Spirit of God makes it plain, he, he, he speaks personal to you, he convicts you, and when you don't reject it, but then receive that word, and then you turn towards him, and you trust him by faith, all of those riches in his grace become yours. Not because you worked for it, not because you earned it, because you simply believed. Faith, it's the, it's the illustration Paul uses in the New Testament to show it's not by works. 
Faith is not a work, but it is your responsibility to make a decision to trust in him. And apart from faith, you don't get any of the grace. Apart from faith, you don't have salvation. Apart from faith, you have nothing. You're still in need to be born again because of your spiritual deadness. So to display God's grace, notice verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are his workmanship. Why did God save us? What did God do all this for? <laughs> it says we were created in Christ Jesus to do something, to do good works. Man, God's handiwork is pretty awesome. Would you agree? You ever look up in a night sky or a beautiful day and clouds and, man, and you just look out and his handiwork is amazing. And you just think, man, God's signature over that. But you know the greatest creation, I believe, his greatest handiwork, is the transformation power at work in someone's life in Christ Jesus when he makes them a new creation. When he pulls someone out of their deadness, bestows on them his love and sonship and daughtership and makes them his beloved and bestows all the exceeding richness of his grace, forgives them of all sins, past, present, and future, and makes them adopted in the beloved. When he does all that, man, you, that's his handiwork. And he was meant for all of that to happen to send you off into a lost world who desperately needs the same thing. That they would see our light, our lamp. Not hidden, no, no. But they would see it and glorify our Father in heaven. He saved you by his grace to do good works. God was working in your life. This is an amazing truth here. And this beyond our comprehension. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God has already prepared everything that you should walk in. Isn't that awesome? What blows my mind is while I was in verses 1 through 3 living like a heathen, hellion, and doing all that stuff, God in his sovereignty and, and somehow beyond my comprehension was preparing everything that I'm walking in right now. That I just... My mind wants to crumble and melt when I, I can't think about that because I was in utter rebellion. I didn't want to talk about him. I didn't want to be around people that talked about him. I wanted to be around people that wanted to do what I wanted to do. But in the midst of all of that, God was preparing good work so that when you were saved, you're not just beam me up, Scotty, to heaven. You're saved for good works. That's what you're saved for, to do something. God's prepared it all. Here's the good news. All you got to do is say yes. You don't even got to come up with the plan. You ain't got to figure out what you're going to do. He's done all that. He's prepared all of that. All you got to do is say yes and then walk in it. Just surrender your heart and say yes to him. That's it. Thank God because I'm not smart enough to figure all this stuff out. Just say yes and he's already got it prepared and then you just begin walking in obedience. And when you walk by faith, it's just one step of obedience at a time. What's next? All right, we'll do that. And then you step out there. What's next? And then you do that. And you link these steps of obedience together and you look back and you, man, it's the good works God had already prepared all along. But he does that in, in, with us as we just say yes and as we do it. He works these things out together. He was preparing your assignment as well before you were even saved. He was preparing it, still preparing it, as we walk and tell him yes. Now, a bow and arrow, would you say those go together? I mean, if you take a bow and, and you take an arrow, one's not much good without the other one. I mean, well, something is missing. I got a bow and arrow at my house. It's just sitting under my bed, just collecting dust. Uh, hadn't, hadn't used it since I was in verses one through three. Um, and so they're, it's just sitting there, but if you pull them out, you pull them out together. One, there's just something missing without the other. I'll tell you this, and this is what Paul would say is what he's saying in our text. Salvation without works. You got something missing. 
Because God worked out this to bring about this. And if you got salvation and you don't got work, you got a bow without an arrow. You got something, but there's something missing. And on the other hand, if you got works, but you don't have salvation, you got problems there too. They both go hand in hand. And really, ultimately, if you got works, you, you don't have nothing at all without your salvation. You got something that might look good on the outside, but there is still a heart, sinful condition, rebellious stuff that's going on down in there that's still going to send you straight to hell and, and you're going to suffer the brunt of God's wrath. You need the bow and you need the arrow. And here's the thing. God has a target for your life. God has a target for you and he's got a target for me to hit. And as when he saves us, what he begins to do is he begins mature in our faith. He begins helping us grow. He begins uh, helping our understanding as we grow in grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. He begins chipping off stuff in your life that don't need to be there. He begins grooming the arrow. He begins balancing it out. He, he begins to make sure it's ready. He even puts it in his quiver and doesn't even use you for a little bit and frustrates you. And, but at the moment, and it's right, man, there's a target for you to hit. And God, just he reached out that quiver that's been balanced and it's ready to go. And then he fires you, and you'll hit the target. But you'll never hit your target if you haven't first trusted in Jesus Christ. And you'll never hit your target if you have not said yes completely to his will. You need both salvation and works. One is not much good without the other. We're going to have a time of preparation as we have our last and final song. And here's what I would tell you in our final remarks. God didn't invest in your life for you to sit in storage. Would you say that, that that'd be kind of foolish, right? God to bestow his love on you, do all this stuff in your life, forgive you of all your sins. That'd all be meaningless if there was no plan after that, right? God didn't invest in you. God didn't do all of those things for you to collect dust and sit in storage. God invested in your life for you to do something, to display his grace, to walk in good works. And if your plan is to sit on a church pew until you go to heaven, I'm not sure you're going to get there. What kind of mentality is that? Some, there is a disconnect if that's what's going on. He saved you, invested in your life for you to do something, to walk in good works. And if you were to tell me today, you know, all right, preacher, I, I want to do that. I don't even know where to start. You can start by just saying, yes. Give God your yes up front. And you can come down when we have this last song. You come and pray at this altar and just say, Lord, I'm just giving you my yes. I'm just telling you right now, whatever it is, if you save me, I know it's for a purpose. I want to hit my target. Fire me, Lord, when you're ready. And I'm just simply coming to tell you yes to the good works, yes to whatever it is. Maybe your yes today needs to be yes to Jesus for the first time. If you were to consider your testimony and you don't even know where to begin, if you were to look back in your past and you think, man, I don't know if it's my past or my present. I, there's nothing that's happened in my life. Today is the day where you can step from death, spiritual deadness, and be awakened and quickened to life in Christ by his Holy Spirit, by the new birth. If you'll exercise faith today, the Holy Spirit speaking to you right now, would you respond to that by faith and just say, yes, God, it's me. Would you save me? I need your forgiveness spare me from your wrath would you pour out your grace on me today make that your day where you exercise faith in him whatever it is may our testimony bring him glory would you stand to your feet I ask you to bow your heads and hearts with me I don't know what camp you'd find yourself in today maybe you're walking in your good works and I'll just tell you keep doing it but maybe today it's you that needs to just say yes. Won't you tell him that right now? Would you give him your yes?
to what he's already prepared for you. Maybe today you need to begin that relationship. You need to get out of the past and be born again today. Tell him yes. Admit that it's you and tell him yes. In a few minutes, we're going to have our last song, and I'm going to invite you to do something with that decision. Your first good work today be coming down, making that public. If there's a decision you need to make today, man, we want to join in the praise and the angels. If you want to come and pray at these steps, you can simply do that as well. But let's give our yes to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we come before you today. and. We just thank you for working in our life, pulling us out of our brokenness. We couldn't do anything on our own. Thank you, God, for getting the good news, the message of Jesus to us. Lord, I pray right now that there be someone in this room that would step from death into life. I pray right now someone that's listening online would give them your yes to whatever you're asking and calling them to do. I pray you would move us into obedience. I pray the disconnect would be over. I pray we'd marry our salvation with our good works today. Lord, would you see to it? Would you move in our hearts? We give you this time for you to do that. And thank you, God, in advance for what you're going to bring out of today. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. As we sing, won't you come? Make your decision. May God bless you as you give him your yes.